here with our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Ekta Patel. Um, I'll be introducing her in a, in a, more formally in a minute. Uh, I do have uh, several announcements. Uh, to be brief, though, uh, tonight after Ekta's talk, uh, there is a, a program that Chabot is hosting for International Observe the Moon Night. And that starts at 8.30 and will go till 10 o'clock. And it is combined with our virtual telescope program. So it will be Gerald, myself, uh, and uh, also uh, some other participants from Chabot, as well as participants from NASA Ames. And uh, it's a combined effort between the NASA Ames uh, education team and the Chabot Space and Science Center to uh, put together some educational programming for International Observe the Moon Night. So we'll have a live viewing of the moon through the telescopes as well as some other presentations that are very interesting. So uh, feel free to join us uh, for that on the Chabot Facebook page, or you can go to the Chabot YouTube channel for that as well. Um, the, the Facebook page is probably the easier one to find if you haven't visited either of those two. Um, Things are happening fast and furious up here uh, on the 12th of November. In fact, that whole weekend, the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th, uh, Chabot is going to be reopening, and uh, the telescope deck will be reopened to the public. The following Friday on the 19th, uh, EIS will be reopening the Telescope Makers Workshop, of course, just in time for the Thanksgiving holiday, in which case will be closed the following Friday, but opening again the Friday after that. So um, we're going to be experimenting with actually opening to the public and remembering how to interact with other human beings for the first time in two and a half years. So uh, I hope that some of you, if not all of you, can join us at some point that weekend, uh, come up to the telescope deck and uh, say hello. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, Gert uh, Gottschalk had reminded me that this weekend and next weekend is also the proceedings of the Antique Telescope Society. Uh, it is a free program. Uh, if you search for the Antique Telescope Society, you'll find their website. You can register for the program, and they have keynote speakers uh, uh, during the day, uh, both weekends. So uh, highly recommend it if you have any interest in historical instruments. Uh, uh, it's a good group. So uh, that's all I got to say. So I want to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Ekta Patel, who is a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley's Miller Institute for Basic Research. Uh, this is a very prestigious uh, fellowship, and we're very lucky to have her. Uh, her specialty is uh, simulations and models to understand the dynamics of satellite galaxies orbiting around our own Milky Way galaxy and uh, our neighboring galaxies in the local group. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Ekta and uh, we will take questions at the end of our presentation with uh, both uh, on Facebook and in the chat. So feel free to save up your questions or go ahead and put them in the chat or QA window uh, on the uh, on the Zoom page uh, as you see fit. So take it away, Ekta. All right. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Can you sure. see my slides okay? Yeah, yeah, it looks great. All right. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining tonight. Um, I'm happy to be here to talk to you all. So I will be talking about uh, satellite galaxies in the local group, which has been um, the topic of my work for the last seven years or so. Um, and I will be explaining to you what satellite galaxies are, um, why they are important. So essentially, these are the two questions I'm hoping to address by the end of this talk. What are satellite galaxies and why are they important? And then more excitingly, how do astronomers use observations and simulations to actually study these satellite galaxies? So I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of the history of this field, and I'll discuss things like dark matter and our Milky Way um, and modern observational and computational techniques that are in use currently to understand more about satellite galaxies. But to start, I just want to define a few of the key terms, especially some of the words that you saw in the title of my talk. So before we jump straight to satellite galaxy, I want to focus just on the word galaxy. Um, because when you think of this word or you see this word, you may, may envision pictures like those in the background of the slide, um, but it's actually uh, a, a story that is continuously changing um, even in our modern day. 
So you might see pictures like the following and say, yeah, of course, this is a galaxy. These are all galaxies. You've probably seen many of these images before. But then it sort of begs the question, well, why aren't things that look like this galaxies as well? So um, the modern definition of a galaxy is uh, one that only came about in, in approximately the year 2012. Um, but it's this definition that, that sort of keeps on changing. And it was actually only 100 years ago, almost to this day, that there was a debate about, is our Milky Way the only galaxy and the entirety of the universe? Or are there multiple galaxies like our Milky Way that make up our entire universe? So these are questions that have been um, asked not that recently in the past, if you're thinking on astronomical timescales. Um, but I'd like to show you what uh, we astronomers use as our current definition of a modern galaxy. And if you ask me what my opinion is, I would guess that this definition will only continue to um, evolve and become a, a more and more complex as time goes on. So here is our current definition of what is a modern galaxy. A galaxy is a gra gravitationally bound collection of stars whose properties cannot be explained by a combination of baryons and Newton's laws of gravity. So let's break this down a little bit further. By baryons, I'm referring to the subatomic particles like protons and neutrons. And when we're thinking about the universe, the baryons are essentially all of the luminous matter that we can see. The stars, the dust, the gas that we see in the pictures of galaxies that I was showing you earlier. And then by Newton's laws of gravity, of course, we're talking about things like force equals mass times an acceleration, um, the fact that massive bodies feel equal and opposite forces, et cetera. So your basic laws of gravity. Um, so this is what our, our current definition of a galaxy is, and what distinguishes some of the images that I was showing earlier from the couple that had a question mark on them as to why are they not galaxies, um, it really leads to, to one main interpretation that um, astronomers as a, as a whole um, typically tend to abide by as an explanation as to what is and is not a galaxy. And so that interpretation is that galaxies in addition to being gravitationally bound collections of stars that follow this definition, um, they also have some additional mass. And we think that this additional mass comes in the form of dark matter. So that's what we think of when we're talking about satellite ga or galaxies in general. Um, and then I would like to go into what is a satellite galaxy. And we will come back to the topic of dark matter later in case you're interested in that. Okay, so satellite galaxies, what are they? By their name, you may simply guess, they might be just like the moon orbiting around the Earth, where the moon is a satellite of the Earth. So similarly, satellite galaxies are galaxies orbiting around other galaxies. And in the context of this particular talk, I'll be referring to satellite galaxies and host galaxies, where the host galaxy is typically the more massive, physically larger galaxy that's um, the center of the gravitational field we'll be discussing. And the satellite galaxy is the smaller, less massive, less physically large galaxy that is orbiting around the bigger one at the center. There are satellite galaxies that we can talk about in other contexts, such as in um, galaxy clusters, uh, but that will not be what I'll be talking about today. So here's our definition of a satellite galaxy that we'll be using for the next hour. And then finally, we have the local group. So many of you may be familiar with this term. It's not the most exciting term in the world, but it simply refers to the collection of galaxies that are in the Milky Way's galactic neighborhood. So let's look at an illustration of what this is referring to. So here's a graphic that shows an example of a galaxy like our own Milky Way, a spiral galaxy. And all of these other little blips of light with labels are referring to some of the satellite galaxies that we know of orbiting around our own galaxy, therefore satellite galaxies. Our local group also consists of our neighboring Andromeda galaxy, which is illustrated here. And similarly, Andromeda too has dozens of satellite galaxies that are orbiting around Andromeda. There are also a few other galaxies that we consider to be a part of the local group, such as some of these isolated dwarfs that are down here. And while they don't appear to be gravitationally bound to either the Andromeda galaxy or the Milky Way galaxy, nevertheless, we do consider these um, as a part of our local group. So most of the satellite galaxies that um, some of that are pictured here or illustrated here, as well as some that are not, not illustrated here at all, um, are typically dwarf galaxies. So they have approximately 100 to a billion um, solar masses worth of stars. And in physical size, they're about 10 to 100 times smaller than the physical size of the luminous part of the Milky Way. 
Um, and then there's just some distance scales here showing you the types of distances that we're talking about. In general, we refer to the local group as um, the sphere with a radius of about one megaparsec or 3.2 million light years. Okay, so that gives you a general picture of the group of galaxies that we're referring to, and this is essentially my laboratory. So I will be talking about some of the specific galaxies in our local group um, and telling you some of the techniques we use to understand these satellite galaxies further. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about um, how and when these satellite galaxies were discovered. Because as I've sort of started to refer to, these are not the only satellite galaxies that we now know of that are pictured here. But rather, this has been an interesting story where more and more satellite galaxies are being discovered um, even now. Uh, every, every few months, there's usually a discovery of a new satellite galaxy. Sometimes when there's new data sets that come out from a specific telescope, a dozen satellite galaxies will be found at once due to advances in technology and techniques. So this is a quite uh, an expanding and exciting area to be working in, especially as a, a young um, a young person in my field, because many of these satellite galaxies were discovered while I was doing my PhD work. So I'd like to show you a, a brief timeline of the satellite um, discoveries around our own Milky Way galaxy. So here on the bottom axis, I'm plotting the year that these satellite galaxies were discovered. And on the Y axis, we'll be sh we'll showing the cumulative number of satellites known as a function of the dates. So I've only put this timeline back to the year 1700. But these uh, two satellite galaxies called the Magellanic Clouds, which I'll show you a picture of in just a minute, um, were two of the, the first known satellite galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way. Um, and they were discovered much, much, much before the year 1700 um, by many different human civilizations that have lived all across the Southern Hemisphere. I'm sure many of you watching here today have probably seen the Magellanic Clouds from the Southern Hemisphere. If you're in a lucky dark place with not a lot of light pollution, you can probably see them just with your bare eyes. So these are the small and large Magellanic Clouds encircled here. Um, and this is a, an image taken down in Chile. So the Magellanic Clouds orbit around our own Milky Way, they're visible in the Southern Hemisphere, and they're actually also the two most massive satellite galaxies that are orbiting around the Milky Way. Okay, so those are the two um, first satellite galaxies discovered. And then um, as we proceeded into the 1900s and into the year about 1950, 1960, um, about 10 more satellite galaxies were discovered um, in photographic plates. So of course, this was much before the digital age. And so satellite galaxies are being discovered quite literally by, with, by eye on these photographic plates. However, as you advance to the millennium in the year 2000, we started to have much more advanced technology. Things like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a telescope at Apache Point in New Mexico, that started to discover some satellite galaxies because of the way that this survey is designed and because of the technical capabilities of the cameras involved. So not only are the cameras more powerful and that they can um, actually detect fainter and smaller galaxies, but this digital sky survey aspect of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey means that this um, particular telescope was scanning large swaths of the sky many, many times over. And with that data set that is so vast, you can then go and apply algorithms that allow you to find these clusters of stars and then understand further whether they are truly satellite galaxies or not. So in the year 2000 and into the year 2010, there were several different discoveries of satellite galaxies found in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data. And then similarly, um, at about 2010 and beyond, another more advanced camera came online. Um, now this one was based down in Chile as well. And it, was, um, it collected data that ended up being called the Dark Energy Survey. And while I will not be talking about dark energy in this talk, the data that came from the dark energy survey was again very useful in understanding and learning more about satellite galaxies. So essentially by the year 2010, the number of known satellite galaxies had doubled from prior to that. And then again, um, in the last 10 years or so, that number has yet again doubled. So we're now talking about almost 60 known satellite galaxies around the Milky Way and about 35 known satellite galaxies around the Andromeda galaxy. Um, and I'm assuming that this, these numbers will just continue to grow as we continue to search all of the all parts of the sky in a uniform way, um, as well as with new technologies that are coming online, such as um, the, the LSST survey, which will be taken with the Vera Rubin Observatory, also based down in Chile, um, as well as a few different space-based telescopes that will be coming online in the next decade or so. 
Okay, so that's a little bit of the history of how we've come to learn about these satellite galaxies um, and how so many of them were discovered in just the last 10 years or so. So I've told you all about these satellite galaxies, but now you might be wondering, well, why are these satellite galaxies important and why am I spending the next you know, 45 minutes listening to this talk all about them? So there's a few different reasons why satellite galaxies are important. Of course, there's uh, many more detailed ones, but I'm gonna go over three of the main reasons why these satellite galaxies are important in the larger context of the entirety of the universe. So the first is that these particular satellite galaxies, especially the faintest and smallest of these satellite galaxies, are actually relics of the early universe. So here I'm showing um, an image you may have seen various versions of, where you're essentially looking at um, a very basic outline of the history of the universe. So on the right side here, you see the Big Bang, and then you see the next marker is a few hundred million years after the Big Bang is when the first galaxies started to form. And that's the class of galaxies where we think these very ultra faint dwarf galaxies that happen to be satellite galaxies, um, that, that they tell us more about this era of the universe. Um, so it's quite exciting because they help us uh, understand what the environments of the universe were like in different areas, um, all the way back to this very early time frame in the history of the universe. And then here's just a little plug for something that I'm sure many of you are very excited about, which is the hopefully very future launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, um, which is scheduled to currently launch on December 18th of this year. Um, so James Webb will also be extremely helpful in learning even more about these ultra faint dwarf galaxies and helping us understand even further what the early universe was like. <clears throat> Reason number two why these satellite galaxies are important is they are the building blocks of galaxies in some sense. So just like you need to water plants for them to grow and continue to be healthy, satellite galaxies are really what contributes to the growth of galaxies like our own Milky Way um, over time. So this illustration that I had in my title slide comes back here into play because these satellite galaxies, eventually over time, they fall towards the center of their host galaxies. And perhaps after one or two or three or multiple passages, they actually end up merging into their central host galaxy. So here, what you're seeing is the body of a satellite galaxy in this orange sphere, and it's orbited around its host galaxy um, almost one and a half times here. And what you're seeing in these yellow dots are stars that are coming away from the central body of this satellite galaxy, and they're forming this stellar stream of stars. You can think of it as a ribbon of stars coming away from this galaxy. And over time, as these stars continue to get ripped away from that satellite galaxy, it will, at some point in the future, just become one with the host galaxy that it's orbiting around. So that's what I mean when I say that these satellite galaxies are truly the building blocks of galaxies like our own Milky Way, because we think the Milky Way and as well as the Andromeda galaxy have had many of these events happen in their past. And that's why they have a lot of the properties that we, we measure and that we see today. Um, so the next, uh, so actually I'll go on to show a couple of different um, forms of galaxy mergers because this is a, a central um, reason why these satellite galaxies are important. So you may have seen images like this, where you're walking through the phases of galaxies coalescing into one another through this process of merging. So here the two, two galaxies are just near each other in space. In the next photo, you can see that they look like they're a little bit closer and that their morphologies have started to change as a result of them coming closer to each other. By the third frame, they have already started to interact. And then by frames four and five, they may have interacted a few times. And finally, by frame six, they have merged into one new, more massive, larger galaxy. So that's generally what we're talking about when we're referring to galaxy mergers. However, in these pictures, all of these galaxy mergers or stages of these galaxy mergers are showing you the merging of two equal mass galaxies. So when I'm referring to satellite galaxies, recall that I'm referring to these very small, less massive galaxies that won't completely proceed in the way that we see in these frames, but rather we'll see them really feeding the central host galaxy that they're orbiting around. So to illustrate that a little bit further, I wanna show you a movie in my next slide where we will watch satellite galaxies that are simulated um, fall into a galaxy that is supposed to resemble one like our Milky Way. And these satellite galaxies will whirl around and around their central host galaxy, and you'll see what happens to them as that process continues. Okay. So you'll see a time clock in the bottom left. GYR refers to giga years or billions of years. 
And so you're seeing here these satellite galaxies falling into the central galaxy and as representative of a spiral galaxy like our Milky Way. And you're seeing some of these satellites pass, pass in and fall towards the center and then fly back out. Other smaller ones fall in once and they never make it back out. Um, but in general, you're seeing this, this very large mess, essentially, of many satellite galaxies falling towards that central host galaxy. But over time, you're seeing that they really are um, being disrupted and merging into that central host galaxy. So this is what we mean when we're talking about um, the growth of galaxies like our Milky Way and the role that satellite galaxies play. So I already told you that these streams that we see in this illustration are referred to as stellar streams. Um, and these them, themselves are very interesting because satellite galaxies and the remnants of them actually help us learn about the host galaxy. So this stellar stream and its orbit and the way that it becomes disrupted and the shape that it takes on is actually dictated by the gravitational potential of this host galaxy in the center. So by studying these streams of stars and how they're moving and maybe trying to reproduce with models how these streams formed, we can actually learn a bit more about the galaxy that is at the center of that um, gravitational field. So those are some of the main reasons why these satellite galaxies are important. Um, and before we go a little bit further into uh, understanding satellite galaxies and some of the techniques that we use to study them, I just want to show you um, where they are and sort of what they look like relative to the anatomy of the Milky Way. Because these two, um, the, the satellite galaxies as a population and the host galaxy for in this talk and the example of, a, of the Milky Way um, are very intimately tied to one another. So I want to make sure that we, we understand the larger picture here, um, but not so large as just the entire local group. So um, this is just an artist's depiction of the Milky Way based on real data. So if you were to look at the Milky Way from above, this left image is what you would see, a spiral-like galaxy with a very um, easily identifiable bar in the center. And our solar system is located along one of these spiral arms about midway through the disk of this galaxy. If you look edge on from the side, you would see again the bar at the center as, and a bulge at the center as well. You see the galactic disk. And you also see a few other features, for example, a stellar halo, which is a very diffuse halo of stars orbiting around the larger disk. But there's one component that is not captured in these pictures that's actually um, very closely tied to why I care about satellite galaxies. And that is the fact that we believe that galaxies live in dark matter halos. So if we were to take a galaxy like our Milky Way, a spiral galaxy, I've very crudely drawn on um, a not to scale um, component referring to the reservoir of dark matter that we think surrounds a galaxy like our Milky Way. So in reality, the extent of these dark matter halos we think are 20 times larger than the disk of the galaxy. Um, and, they, and they have a lot of mass to them. So if you were to think about what is the, the total mass of a galaxy and how much of that belongs to dark matter, we think roughly 85% of a galaxy's mass is actually in this dark matter that we can't see with our eyes or with telescopes. Because as the name suggests, dark matter is dark and it only um, interacts with the luminous baryons through gravity. Um, now you might be wondering, well, if this dark matter is dark, how do we know it's actually there? So one, one reason for evidence for dark matter um, is made famous by Vera Rubin. So Vera Rubin looked at the rotation of many spiral galaxies and mapped the speeds of the stars in those galaxies from the center all the way out to the furthest um, ring of stars that one could essentially see. So in this, this chart here, what you're seeing is for this galaxy in the background, the x-axis is showing you the distance from the center and the y-axis here is showing you the speed, the rotation speed of the stars as we move outwards from the center of that galaxy. So what Vera Rubin observed is this ring curve where, as you might imagine, if you were looking at something like a pinwheel, this, the um, points in the pinwheel closest to the center are moving much faster than the points at the edge of the pinwheel that are moving slower. You find a similar motion in galaxies, or you would at least expect to find similar motion. Um, however, Vera Rubin found that actually as you move further and further and further away from the brightest points of a galaxy, especially a spiral galaxy, you don't see the expected decline in rotation speeds, but rather it plateaus. So she observed this gap in the speeds of these stars, which essentially suggests that 
there has to be more mass associated to these galaxies as you move further and further away from the brightest central point of them in order to explain the rotation speeds that she was seeing. And she repeated this experiment many times and found the same results. So it wasn't just one fluke galaxy that um, you know, didn't, didn't show the expected behavior, but rather there was a large sample of galaxies that were all showing this very similar um, and confusing at the time behavior. So essentially this is one piece of evidence that there, there might be dark matter in the outskirts of these galaxies. And it's this gap in what was expected from the rotation speeds of the stars in these galaxies compared to what was observed that led her to believe that there has to be some invisible massive matter in the outskirts of these galaxies. So that's one way that we um, have got good evidence that we think dark matter exists around um, pretty much all galaxies in the, in the universe. Okay, now I've told you about dark matter, I've told you about satellite galaxies, I've told you why satellite galaxies are important. But let's start building this picture together as a whole. So satellite galaxies act essentially as tracers of the dark matter halos of their host galaxies. So here what I'm showing, again, is a very... Uh, crude depiction of a galaxy like our own Milky Way, where you see a bulge and a disk at the center. And this pale yellow sphere that I've added on here is, is supposed to represent the dark matter halo around the Milky Way. Um, and what you're seeing in these lines and what's, what's happening as we're moving forward in time, each of these lines is actually representing a satellite galaxy that we know about. And the lines that they're tracing out are the orbital histories that we think that each of these satellite galaxies are following. So this, this is the kind of work that I do where I, where I I model the orbits of these satellite galaxies in order to understand more about um, how the satellite galaxies are interacting with their hosts, how these satellite galaxies cluster together as a function of time, and generally just what do the shapes of these orbits look like and what do we learn from that and what, we, what can we predict about the future fate of these galaxies from that information. So here um, I'm just trying to emphasize that this, if this is the dark matter halo of the Milky Way represented here, these satellite galaxies are really um, uh, tracing right through that dark matter halo. And so if we can't see that dark matter halo, but we can model the orbits of the satellite galaxies, that alone is starting to tell us a little bit more about these halos that are um, around galaxies like our Milky Way. So here I've represented this dark matter halo just as a simple sphere, but we're actually not sure that this dark matter lives in this perfect sphere. Rather, we don't know if it has um, an irregular shape to it. We don't know if there's an oval kind of shape, a football shape, a pancake-like shape, or just some irregular shape altogether, which is actually what current studies are sort of pointing towards, that there's not a regular shape to this dark matter halo around a galaxy like the Milky Way. Another thing I want to emphasize as I'm showing this video is that um, this time counter is, is counting very fast, but it's also counting in very large units of time. So the orbits of these satellite galaxies really take a few billion years for a single satellite galaxy to orbit around its host galaxy just one time, as opposed to it taking a year for the Earth to orbit around the sun, we're talking about extremely long time scales. And that's why we have to be clever about the observations and the modeling that we use in combination in order to really understand and trace back the histories of these satellite galaxies, since we can't just wait and wait and wait and try to trace them in real time by using telescopes. So I'll explain now how we use a combination of telescopes and simulations to come up with models like the ones that I'm showing in this image here, or this video rather. So first I'll talk about the observational aspect of how we use observations to study satellite galaxies, and then I'll talk about simulations and then we'll combine them all together. So um, the image in the back here is of course the Hubble Space Telescope, and the Hubble Space Telescope has been very key to understanding a lot about the satellite galaxies that we currently know about. So I'll explain a little bit of how the Hubble Space Telescope has been used to measure the motions of these satellite galaxies and then how those motions are useful in the types of orbital modeling that I was just showing. So how do we measure the motions of galaxies? And I'm specifically referring to the full three-dimensional motion of galaxies in space. Well, first you may have a distance to a galaxy or a star in a specific galaxy by knowing its relative brightness. So there are various objects in the universe, such as supernovae, that help us learn about um, very standard distance scales. And so by comparing the brightness of stars in a specific galaxy to that standard brightness scale or distance scale, we can figure out how far away a galaxy or a cluster of stars are from us. So that tells you a one-dimensional distance. 
Now we can also measure the spectrum of a star. So we can measure the radiation that's emitted by stars. And by doing so through the Doppler shift, you can learn what is the velocity of that star in the directions toward or away from you, which we refer to as the line of sight velocity. So again, this is a one dimensional motion where we learn how is this galaxy or the star moving towards or away from me. So these are both essentially 1D measurements, one dimensional. But we really wanna know how these are moving in three dimensions. So what you have to do is track the motion of a star as a function of time. So if you take one image of a star, let's say right now, and you can track the motion of that star and take it, uh, take another image again, let's say in 10 years, you can measure something called a proper motion. And all it's really referring to is a measure of an angular motion across the sky. So astronomers like to think of the sky as sort of two dimensional. And so if you can take one image now and one image later, you can essentially figure out what the angle uh, of the change in distance of that star is. And when you have all of this information all together, you can actually combine it to derive something called a transverse velocity, which in short just means we knew the one dimensional velocity of this star of this galaxy, but by combining distance and proper motion, we can figure out what the two dimensional transverse velocity, so the, in this plane of the sky. So altogether, you then end up with a 3D motion of how this star or galaxy is moving in space, both in terms of where it is positionally located in three dimensions, as well as where it's moving in full three dimensions um, in space as well. So this is, you may think of a very simple set of measurements, um, but in practice, it's actually quite difficult to tease out these measurements um, because space is so vast and galaxies are separated by such a large distance that in our human lifetimes, these galaxies or these stars in these galaxies are not actually moving very quickly at all, at least in our eyes. So I'd like to show a movie that illustrates in more detail and with real data how these measurements look if you were to speed them up in with a timer rather than looking at them on human life scales. So this will be a, a movie of measuring the motion of the Andromeda galaxy, actually. So we'll be looking at how the proper motion of the Andromeda galaxy was measured. Again, that's the, the two-dimensional velocity in this direction. So as this movie plays, we'll zoom into this little blue box where you will see stars that are indeed associated with Andromeda. I know that you see the main body of the galaxy here, but there are still stars associated to the Andromeda galaxy that are, that are further away from the galactic disk. Um, so just trust me when I say that the stars in here are indeed Andromeda stars. Um, but as I start to play this now, you'll see we'll zoom in. The brightest white stars will be the stars associated with the Andromeda galaxy. And you'll see them starting to drift now. And they're drifting with respect to objects that are staying stationary, which are often background galaxies. And these background galaxies are so, so, so far away relative to the Andromeda galaxy that they essentially appear as if they're staying still. So I'll play that movie one more time. We're zooming in. Note there's a time clock in the bottom right. It's starting in the year 2012. It's counting up and the stars start to drift. Again, with respect to the, the stationary background galaxies um, that are much further away. Now, if you're watching the time clock in the bottom right, you see that this is counted up to the year 26,112. And the reason is, again, that these, these motions are so small in, in the sense of our own human lifetimes that it's very difficult to see these with the human eye. So not only do you need very powerful instruments on telescopes, but you also need very powerful tools and techniques to apply to that data to really tease out this extremely small motion. And as an analogy, I like to say that measuring the motion of the Andromeda galaxy is essentially equivalent to watching human hair grow at the distance of the moon. So we're talking about an extremely small motion that really unlocks a huge area of, of interesting science that we can, we can do while knowing these 3D motions of galaxies. So that was the one example with the Andromeda galaxy. And now let's put together how these proper motions help us learn about orbits. So these proper motions essentially act as the initial conditions for the orbital models that, that I tend to calculate on my day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I won't tell you the details of how, how these models work, but essentially if we know the three-dimensional position and velocity and we have this model, we can then um, trace back in orbital history for each of those satellite galaxies where we have that information. So just as an illustration, I'm approximating some of the orbits that I've calculated in the past for these satellite galaxies around both the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy, just to show you the kind of mess that we end up finding in terms of what are the orbits of these satellite galaxies. You'll see that there's just a broad diversity. They don't all have the same shape. They don't have all of the same extent. Um, and so that ends up being a very intricate and exciting process to understand further. 
um, because there's a lot going on at once and it doesn't look so simple. But that's how we can use the observations to understand the orbits of these galaxies. But now I'm going to turn to simulations and how simulations can also be very helpful to understand satellite galaxies because their evolutionary timescales are on the order of billions and billions of years, which our models can be helpful with, but we want to understand these satellite galaxies in the context of the larger universe and not just as individual galaxies on their own. So um, I'm showing a background image here, which is taken from something called the illustrious simulation. Um, if you've heard another astrophysicist talk about simulations, you may have heard that name. Um, but essentially, these simulations, which are referred to as cosmological simulations, um, are, are like recreating a mock universe in a computer, where you can reproduce hundreds of thousands of galaxies with a whole diversity of properties and sizes and shapes and all kinds of different properties. Um, but you're essentially making a universe in your computer. Now, it's not in a computer like the one I'm talking to you on today or that you're listening to me on at home or wherever you are. But of course, these will take um, require some of the most powerful computers um, on the Earth. So I'll tell you a little bit about these simulations and then how, how we actually use those um, on their own in addition to observations to, to understand more about these satellite galaxies. So here I'm showing um, an image of a slab of this simulated data where it just looks like a web, probably. Um, that's how I like to describe it. But what you're seeing actually is what we refer to as the cosmic web, where this is a very, very, very large volume, which is representing many hundreds of thousands of galaxies and all of the associated dark matter. But the way you can think about this web and how we think galaxies form in general in the universe is that at the, at the nodes of each of these filaments you see, where there are the brightest pink spots, that's where we think groups and clusters of galaxies are forming. So much of the universe, as I was saying earlier, is filled with these voids of darkness where there's maybe dark matter, there's some other intra, um, intergalactic material, but really the galaxies are only forming at the most dense points in space and time, um, which is where all of these filamentary nodes of material are coalescing together. Um, so we refer to that as a cosmic web. Here's it playing in actions so that just showed you a quick little slice of how um, the cosmic web is evolving in time or how we think it could evolve in time. Um, but I've told you a little bit about these cosmological simulations and I wanna just break down a little bit further what, what exactly those mean and how, how do we get them to, to actually exist? Um, because some of the next work that I'll be telling you about does heavily rely on trusting that these cosmological simulations are um, actually applicable to the real universe. So I like to describe this, the way that these simulations are built like a recipe where you need your ingredients. And in this case, some of the ingredients are a set of equations describing the growth of the universe from the Big Bang to today. Um, if you're doing this com computationally, of course, you need an efficient code to implement the model that you're applying. Um, you need to divide, decide on some specs like the number of particles and spatial resolution and simulation size that you want to tackle. So in short, I mean, do you want to model just one galaxy or do you want to model 10 galaxies or do you want to model hundreds of thousands of galaxies? Because there are so many different kinds of astrophysical simulations that exist out there to study different types of objects. <clears throat> then you need your cooking tools. In this case, our cooking tools are supercomputers. So you can essentially think of these supercomputers as thousands of your desktop or your laptops um, combined all together in one. And then you need some directions. So in this case, our directions are, are answers to questions like, how do stars form? How do galaxies merge? How do black holes contribute to the galaxy evolution within that, the that the black holes are, are held within? All kinds of questions like that that have been addressed with observations that we can then make conclusions about and feed back into a simulation. Then of course you have to wait and we don't have 13.8 billion years to wait. So this is why we turn to models and computers. So the super supercomputer runs for a model 13.8 billion years, um, but really realistically this takes um, a few thousand CPU hours on these very high powered machines um, or essentially when it's broken up into different chunks and run on different supercomputers around the world, it would take about a few years in, in real human lifetime. And then, of course, you get a very nice output. And in the case of this specific simulation that I'm referring to, we're talking about a thousand gigabytes of simulated galaxies and their surroundings um, that have been tested and vetted to make sure that the properties of the galaxies we see in the simulations are truly matching the properties of galaxies that we observe in the universe. This is tested in many different ways. And so once many of those tests have been passed or, um, or you know, caveated for some reason or another, we then know how well we can use these simulations to, um, to interpret things that we see in observations. 
So I'm gonna show a quick movie and then I'll start wrapping up. So this is a movie of the illustrious simulation. On the left, you're seeing the evolution of dark matter in the simulation. You see, again, this cosmic web. We're at the brightest pink points or the nodes of these filaments. Galaxies are starting to form. On the right side, you're seeing the gas temperature, so the gas that will turn into stars. And you see there's a similar structure in the left and the right. The gas, you'll see there are, there's starting to be explosions on the right side. These are very massive stars that are exploding as supernovae. They're throwing gas out at very large scales. That gas will be recycled and turn into new stars. And so you're seeing time count forward. More and more of these explosions are happening. More galaxies are being formed. And you're essentially ending up with a cosmic web that is supposed to be representative of what we see in the universe today. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the Lester simulation was run on over 8,000 computer cores. It took 19 million CPU hours. And that is equivalent to your desktop or laptop running for about 2,000 years, which of course is not very possible. And that's why we turn to these supercomputers. So I've told you about these simulations. They reproduce many, many galaxies in the universe or, or galaxies like the ones we see in the universe. And so we can use the simulated data to go back to the question of satellite galaxies, why they're important and how we um, study them with these simulations. So I'll walk you through a little bit of a test case. So we use these simulations to find mass analogs of the Milky Way. So we approximately look for simulated galaxies in this, in this large data set for Milky Way-like galaxies. And so some of these are pictured here. These are not pictures of real galaxies. These are actually pictures of simulated galaxies or fake data, if that's what you'd like to call it. Um, but these are galaxies that are roughly like the Milky Way in both their spiral-like shape and in their mass, which is about a trillion times the mass of the sun. What I do with galaxies like this, so I build up a sample of a few hundred of these Milky Way-like galaxies, and then search for satellite galaxies around them in their surrounding neighborhood, just like the, the illustrations I showed you earlier of the satellite galaxies we know to be orbiting around our own Milky Way. Um, in much of my work, I've been interested in the most massive of these satellite galaxies, so similar galaxies that are similar to the Magellanic Clouds, where we're talking about a roughly one to 10 mass ratio. So the satellites are roughly 10% the mass of the host galaxies. Um, so that's the kind of data that we use um, in, from these simulations. And I'd like to tell you about some of the questions that we actually try to use this data to answer. So in summary, with the observations, we get these 3D motions of satellite galaxies, which allow us to trace back the orbits of satellite galaxies. But from the simulations, we get a slightly complementary but different data set, which is you get statistics or hundreds of Milky Way-like galaxies and the properties of the satellite galaxies around those Milky Way-like galaxies. So you essentially have many, many Milky Way-like systems that you can use to study our own true system that we're living inside of. So here are some of the questions that we can use, that we can answer using some of this information. So we can ask things like, what's the frequency of satellite galaxies around simulated galaxies like the Milky Way? Are we missing any of the satellites? By which I mean, should we expect there to be more that we have not yet found based on the simulations? Or do we think we found the right amount or maybe too many already? Is the Milky Way and its satellite system common or rare? Um, again, in terms of its satellites, is the number right? Are the properties of these satellites right? Do we think there's something interesting about the Milky Way compared to other um, Milky Way-like systems we find in the simulations? Are the orbital properties of the satellites that are actually in the true local group typical, or are they strange in some way? And can we learn something about the host galaxies from those properties? And finally, what do the current orbital properties of the satellites imply about the properties of the host galaxy they're orbiting around? Since these are very intimately tied um, questions in terms of satellite populations and the gravitational field of the host galaxy that's dominating that wide region they're orbiting in. Um, so if you're interested in some of those questions, you can look up some of my work. And in just the last one minute or so, I wanna tell you about a real case study about one of the um, projects I worked on early in my graduate career. Um, that used a lot of the tools and techniques that I'm, I told you about today. So we're going to focus on Triangulum, which is called, which is also referred to as the M33 galaxy. I'll just show you a picture of where these two are in this illustration I showed earlier. So here we have the Andromeda galaxy, and this one is Triangulum that I'll continue to refer to as M33, and I'll refer to Andromeda as M31. Triangulum is the most massive galaxy, satellite galaxy orbiting around the Andromeda galaxy. So that's an interesting um, point to remember. Okay, now if you look at various different types of data around the Andromeda galaxy, 
which is shown on the right here. So the gray scale is essentially showing you the density of stars around a wide region encompassing the Andromeda galaxy. And these different um, contours that you see outlined here are actually picking out um, clusters and clumps and streams of stars that are located all around the dark matter halo that's surrounding the Andromeda galaxy. And then in the bottom left here is where M33 is located. So here's the optical disk in the center, and I'm showing the picture here as well. And it's also my background, if you've noticed it. But that's where um, the, the relationship of the Andromeda and uh, Triangulum galaxies are in terms of space. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is just in 2009, um, this survey that this data is from on the right side, it's called the PANDA survey for short, discovered that there's this interesting stellar debris in the outskirts of M33. And the question that naturally arose is, where does this extended stellar debris around M33 come from? And so what that team who discovered this stellar debris in that area proposed is that, well, what if M33 had a very close interaction with M31 in the past? It is a satellite galaxy after all. We saw in a lot of the slides I showed earlier that these satellite galaxies' orbits have very interesting shapes. Perhaps they had interacted in the recent past and they got so close to one another that some of the stars in the main body of M33 became um, unbound from the center of that galaxy, leading to that stellar debris. So this was the original um, hypothesis back then. Um, what I was able to show, because we have um, information about the proper motion of both the Andromeda galaxy and Triangulum, aka we know the 3D motions of both of these galaxies and how they move relative to one another, we can actually ask the question, well, given that we have measurements for the space motion of these galaxies, what kinds of orbits do we recover when we actually use our orbital models to, to trace back those histories? And what we found is an orbital history more like this green line here, where it looks like maybe M33 actually has never interacted with M31 in the past, and it's actually only coming to its closest position relative to M31, its host galaxy today. These results are obviously very much in contradiction with, with one another. Um, however, one was calculated by, by creating a hypothesis based on what M33 looks like right now, and the other one was come about by taking the 3D motions and actually calculating what you would, what you would recover as an orbital history. So we're still not completely sure which of these is the most plausible. There are different reasons to believe both scenarios, but in the event that M33 really is just getting um, close to M31 for the very first time now, as shown by the screen line, and has never interacted with it in the past, we still have the question of where did that stellar debris around M33 come from? And what we think might be one plausible option is that I've told you a lot about satellite galaxies today, but we think there might also be another regime of satellite galaxies that orbit around other satellite galaxies. So some of the most massive satellite galaxies we think could also host their own populations of satellite galaxies, so satellites of satellites kind of hierarchy, and it could be through interactions with those satellites that that debris, that stellar debris that was observed around M33 came to be. So that is what I will leave you with, um, and I will start to take questions. You can see more of my work on my website um, or send me an email. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Patel. That was really sure. interesting. Um, I'm going to actually ask you to end the share so we sure. could see you. Great. Great. Um, we have a handful of questions, mm -hmm. and I want to apologize in advance to people who are attending tonight. We're on a very tight schedule tonight because we have to make the, um, the Zoom uh, account available for our next program uh, that we're doing in conjunction with NASA and Chabot tonight. But there are some very good questions. Um, and uh, the first one is what it is the uncertainty in these projected orbits. Um, you know, you're, 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 re, you're re reducing all of this data, but what, what kind of error bars do you have on this? Yeah, that's a great question and one that I think about very often. Um, so it depends on us on a few different things. Um, so your error bars can be pretty good and they can be not so great. So this depends on a couple of things. Um, one is how many stars are you actually able to observe within a satellite galaxy? So I, I briefly mentioned how they have a range of masses. So you might imagine the more massive ones, we can see more stars in them. If you have more stars, you're averaging mm. the motion of all those stars, so your error is smaller. Another factor is distance. So if, this, if the galaxy is much further away than another satellite galaxy, your margin of error is also gonna go up as a function of one over distance squared. 
So that's another factor that matters. Um, so we are talking about, um, I have these in units of micro arc seconds, so I'll say them in those units, but I can provide conversions later. Um, so we have uh, measurements that are of the order of micro arc seconds that are, which are considered very good for like the Andromeda galaxy or tens of micro arc seconds. And then you can go down by a factor of a thousand for the worst ones. So mm, we're talking about milli arc seconds there. So, um, you know, still very small amounts again, when you're thinking about human distances and life scales and all that, but um, yeah, that's a very crucial question. And I would say that um, the orbits that we are currently calculating, definitely not all of them are trustworthy and I imagine they will continue to change. Um, but we like to think of those sort of as a first order answer of telling us, you know, maybe what the plausible orbital history of a satellite would have been. Um, so I'll say briefly that, you know, I think we can trust the orbital histories for maybe 15 of the satellite galaxies on the, around the Milky Way very well because they're more massive. Many stars are observed, they're closer. And then it's a lot of the really puny ones that are further away that we have just started to be able to model the orbits for. And so I'm guessing they're going to improve with further data releases from Gaia and the Hubble Space Telescope and um, James Webb as well. So we're looking towards a bright future, but there are definitely large errors on some of them. And that's that's the game we're playing. <laughs> Well, that dovetails into one of the other questions, which um, uh, are your techniques uh, valid for farther galaxies like the M81, M82 uh, uh, galaxy cluster? And it sounds to me like it's going to be a matter of instrumentation and uh, technique, uh, probably the next generation of telescopes, the next generation of, 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 of interferometry and spectroscopy that's going to allow you to do the modeling for farther galaxies. Yes, that is very very true. So the, the biggest issue there is that at the distance of M81, you're talking about having to wait. Um, so I, I kind of glossed over this. So for the Andromeda galaxy, the images that were taken to tease out that very small proper motion measurement were taken 10 years apart. And that's because at the distance of the Andromeda galaxy, mm -hmm. you have to wait 10 years to really find any motion in the stars between the two sets of images. If you're talking about M81, which is three or four times further than the Andromeda galaxy, we're talking about tens of decades before you can take the second measurement and then figure out what the 3D motion is. So it is a limitation of the instrumentation. You would essentially need like, a, I think the calculation is something like a 12 or 15 meter telescope in space to be able to measure the proper motions of those galaxies in a shorter time baseline. So yeah, well, a girl can dream, but it's gonna be a little <laughs> bit. But the spectroscopy is good. So when at those systems, we do actually have pretty good one dimensional information, the velocity mm -hmm. in that direction. And that's still helpful information for understanding the satellite galaxies. It's not, you know, it shouldn't be thrown out just because we don't have it in full 3D. That 1D information is still much more useful than no, no information. So certainly. All right. Thank you. Um, another question uh, from the computer modeling, it looks like host galaxies lose their spiral arms when disrupted by satellite galaxies. Is, is that what's uh, really happening here? Um, yeah, I would say generally that's hmm. how we think galaxies merge together, especially spiral galaxies. So for a long time, um, and this is something that, that Hubble proposed, um, he thought that elliptical galaxies merge together to form a spiral galaxy. And what mm -hmm. we've learned since then, which was the you know, also almost 100 years ago, it's the opposite. So yeah. we think spiral galaxies merge together in the process of that. Yes, they do. You know, their morphologies are almost completely distorted, but it does depend on you know, what angle are they interacting at? Are they crashing straight into each other or are they glancing mm. past another, right? So a lot of those questions are important to how the spiral arms will evolve as they merge into one another. But generally you can say, yes, the spiral arms will, will probably be destroyed and they'll end up looking just kind of like a blob at the end rather than nice ordered spiral galaxy. They'll end up looking more like an elliptical galaxy afterwards. So mm -hmm. um, one of our... One of our uh, uh, viewers here was curious about what programming languages are used in your simulations and how many lines of code. Oh, God. Um, OK, so that, there's multiple answers to that. So um, a lot of my analysis personally is done in Python. That's mostly for um, my orbital models are actually in Python because they only take on the order of seconds to run just to trace back mm. the orbital history. So that's exciting. Uh, I'd probably say it's maybe maybe like 1,000, 1,500 lines of code for the orbital modeling part. When you're talking about simulations like the Illustra simulation, which is you know, one of the largest scale simulations that exists probably you know, in the world, 
Um, I have no idea how many lines of code, but I'm sure it's in the millions. Um, and you can look at their website and, and find more information there. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Um, they, I think, primarily, primarily you see as the base for, for a lot of their yeah. code because that's mm -hmm. what interfaces best with supercomputers. Right. Um, yep. All right. Well, thanks for putting that in the chat. Um, let me see if there's anything else here. Oh, uh, one of our uh, first questions that came in during your talk is, uh, can the effects of dark matter be seen on more local scales? Like, are we able to see anything about the orbits of nearby stars or even, you know, I dare say uh, uh, planetary bodies like, you know, gas giants or, you know, Neptune, Uranus, uh, that may be uh, explained by the influences of dark matter? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the short answer is not really, right. um, mostly because the density of the dark matter in, in local, regions and by local I mean solar system scale regions is not high enough I think to dominate over the gravity of the sun pulling on these planets um so I think there there is little known contribution from that if if any known contribution that people have studied um in the term in terms of local solar neighborhood kind of stars this is a lot of what the Gaia spacecraft has been looking at is the local solar neighborhood um I think there's more prospects there um, but I think it's still kind of hard to figure out how to understand, you know, how much the stars are being perturbed and how they're being perturbed in some sense, because the, the key to what I was saying today is that, um, you know, if we, we assume that there is a dark matter reservoir around a Milky Way like galaxy, the satellite galaxies are sort of tracing that out for us. So you would similarly need um, enough dark matter density that's strong enough compared to the pull of the star versus the planets versus other nearby stars. So it's kind of an intricate game, I think, in terms of density and then which massive body is dominating at what um, physical size scale. So I don't know, you know, I, I should say I don't know much about that area and, and people who are looking into that, but I think probably on the solar neighborhood scale, there must be somebody interested in that, but um, it's just not stuff that I've been following very closely. Yeah, it also it seems that you, you, in order to see an influence uh, like that, you you can't have this uniformity of dark matter that would right. be the case in right. a local measurement. Right. Whereas it, between galaxies or between a central galaxy and the dwarf galaxies surrounding it, there's there's at least variance in the amount of dark matter, so you could actually tease out the difference between dark matter and vacuum. Yep, that, that's a good way to put it. All right, well, um, I think that's gonna, you know what I wanna do is type in this link you gave again so everyone could see oh, yeah. it. It's tng-project.org and that's I'm cool. sending that out right now to everyone. Yep. So for those of you who are uh, uh, waiting for that link, go ahead and uh, grab it out of the chat window right now. And in a couple of minutes, we'll, uh, I'll leave it up there for a minute or two, and then we'll call it a night. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I yes, wish you the best welcome. of luck in this, and thank we'll you. be following your research. Thanks. Bye, all. all Thanks right. for listening. All right. Good night, everyone.